Welcome. Welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for deciding to spend some time with us here this afternoon. My name is Corinne Cooper. I'm the president of the Berlin Historical Society. We're very pleased that Orca Media is here recording, which will allow many others to view the program. We appreciate UVM Extension for sharing this excellent classroom space with us today. For years, the UVM Extension was located up on Comstock Road. They moved into this new building in 2015. And to dig back a little bit in history, in 1949, the same year that the drive-in, Twin City Drive-In, opened up at what is now Big Lots, here on this site, Twin Snack Bar was built by Bernard and Leonard Bro. They were twins, juniors in high school, and trying to raise some money to attend college. And so the snack bar specialized in pepper steaks and Mexican red hot dogs and was quite successful. And in 1950, both Bernard and Leonard enrolled at Norwich University. The boys had three brothers, and so all five of them were able to go to college with money raised from their snack bar and the family dairy stand next door. In 1956, the twins' parents purchased the A&W franchise and expanded the building and changed its appearance, and it became Twins A&W Snack Bar. The display board at the back of the room has some more information and photographs, including one of the original building with its knotty pine exterior, and also a picture of Bernard and Leonard when they graduated from Norwich University and had accepted positions at General Electric in Schenectady, New York, and Rome Air Development Center at Griffin, uh, Griffith Air Force Base in Rome, New York. So there were lots of wonderful memories made at this site um, when Twins A&W was here, and that, therefore, is why there's A&W root beer <laughs> in with the refreshments. Y'all know I don't use this soda. <laughs> <laughs> if you didn't notice on your way in, there is a restroom over by the door you came in, and um, hopefully you did get a ch chance to check out the displays, um, photos and maps from mid to late 1800s and early 1900s, binders for you to peruse, and feel free to linger afterwards. I'm in no rush to leave, um, to take a closer look. So the Berlin Historical Society is pleased to host UVM professor Luis Vivanco, a cultural anthropologist who will be presenting of Wheelmen, the New Woman, and Good Roads, Bicycling in Vermont, 1880 to 1920. This presentation is sponsored by the Vermont Humanities through its Speakers Bureau program. In addition to providing public talks, the Vermont Humanities sponsors book discussion programs, a wide variety of literacy programs, and other humanities events statewide. They seek to engage all Vermonters in the world of ideas, foster a culture of thoughtfulness, and inspire a lifelong um, love of reading and learning. Vermont Humanities would very much appreciate your filling out a brief survey wondering how you heard about the program and what you thought of it, I hope you'll take the time to do so, as we certainly appreciate what they offer us here in Vermont. If you haven't yet signed in, I hope you will take a moment to before you leave. Putting the star by your name, um, if you want to be added to the Berlin Historical Society email list, if you're not already on it, for some occasional information on programs, meetings, history events, as well as links to some Vermont history programs to watch at home. Also, if your email address is on the sign in, that's how I can send you the link for the survey for Vermont Humanities, but I did bring a few paper copies if you guys would prefer that. The Berlin Historical Society is always interested in your ideas for programs to hold. Maybe it's even you that has some history to share. If you're not aware, I think most of you are, that uh, Berlin Historical Society has an office up at the Berlin Town offices, 108 Shed Road, Richard Turner and or myself are always happy to make ourselves available if you have questions or would like to do research in the office, whether it's during the day, evenings, weekends, it's all a possibility. Sometimes even the same day can work. There's also, um, the Historical Society has a web page on the, on the um, berlinvt.gov website under the community tab, and this page includes some helpful resources. There's the Berlin Vermont Memories 
group on Facebook. We'd love to have more people join the Historical Society. Members are the ones who can vote on various matters and membership fees help us in preserving and sharing the history and story of Berlin. Um, we could also use assistance on some projects. Help is scarce. We need some help. <laughs> Scanning some items, going through materials that need to be organized and filed, working on some of the theme binders and scrapbooks, planning programs and more. But you're all here today for a program on bicycles. And I know you will be delighted as I am that Professor Vivanco has joined us today to share the fascinating history of bicycles here in Vermont. I'll let the professor tell you more about research he's done, which includes time spent in Costa Rica and Mexico. He's authored and co-authored several books, including textbooks, along with many journal articles on topics including cultural anthropology, democracy, and environmentalism, Central American transitions, and bicycle culture. Professor Gravanko has been traveling around Vermont giving this particular lecture, and I am so excited that we're spending the afternoon hearing about it. Thank you, Corinne. Well, thank you all. I'm so pleased to see you all here on a, on a rainy Saturday, and we can think of sunny days on bicycles um, as, as we sit inside and avoid the, the nasty weather out there. Um, well, I, I'm so pleased, too, to see all of this. I, I was, my comment to Corinne when I walked in was, I've been to a lot of historical societies around this state, and I've never seen in a, a, dig, you know, a spread like this. Um, so there's lots of great information. I, I love Corinne's enthusiasm to learn more, because we've been going back and forth for a couple of weeks with just stories and, and um, newspaper reports and so on. So let's get started. Um, <clears throat> So as Corinne says, I am a professor of cultural anthropology. My specialty is in environmentalist social movements. I've been working in that field for about 25 years. And uh, about 12 years ago, I got a question out of the blue from someone uh, up on campus at UVM who worked in our transportation research center. I'm a cyclist, and he comes to me and he says, you know, we have this research center. Are you interested in doing transportation bicycle research? And I was like, what is that? Like, I don't know what you mean by that. I, I've been riding bicycles obsessively for years and working on them in lots of ways. But what does it mean to do bicycle research? And uh, so I was just, you know, my brain was spinning on that for several weeks. And I thought, oh, someone's probably already done this. And uh, no one had, <laughs> it turns out. So I decided to write a book. Um, uh, called Reconsidering the Bicycle, an Anthropological Perspective on a New Old Thing. And in this book, I kind of lay out what it means to think of the bicycle as a cultural object, as a political object. You know, the big question I had in my mind is, why is it that cities all of a, stu all of a sudden, not just in the United States, but in Europe and Latin America, are, are delivering the bicycle to the center of traffic and saying, this is how we're going to address our urban sustainability problems? Right, so you know the, the idea of the bicycle as a green object, a vehicle for a small planet, these were all on my mind as I was writing this book. And I was doing ethnographic field work, um, long-term, immersive, you know, it involves riding bicycles, which I enjoy, um, and talking and listening to people. Uh, and I've been doing field work in Bogota, Colombia. I've been doing field work in Denmark a little bit, and then in Burlington, Vermont. And my idea was to do field work in places where bicycles are increasingly being taken seriously or have been taken seriously for a while as part of the transportation mix. Well, in this book, I have a section on Burlington. And in that section, I wanted to tell some of the background to the bicycle story in Burlington. Because in the back of my head, I knew that there was a bicycle boom that happened in the 1890s and the early 1900s that took America and Europe by storm. It was a huge phenomenon. And I wondered, what, did, what happened in Burlington? You know, and I wanted to tell that story. Well, what I did was I threw myself into our special collections and uh, found a very willing partner in there who's a bike obsessive, um, who's a librarian. And we uncovered all kinds of stuff that was so rich. And uh, only a small piece of that went into my book. 
So I developed this talk and then a bicycle history bike tour of Burlington, which you can request if you want. We ride around nine miles through Burlington and I show you places where bike history played out in that city. Um, and I, there was just so much and I started expanding my perspective around the state. And now for about five years, I've been doing Vermont wide research on the history of the bicycle in this time. And it's a fascinating thing. Um, and uh, so it, you don't have to be a bicycle obsessive like me to enjoy this. Right? As a cultural anthropologist, I'm really interested in using the bicycle as a lens into social changes and transformations and um, the ways in which people used it to promote certain kinds of political or social agendas. Uh, so the bicycle is a, in some ways a means to an end, but I love bicycles too. Right? So you, know, you can really dive deep into all the details of this, but you don't have to. I want to give you a narrative. Uh, that shows that the, the bicycle played a very interesting and important role in a period of Vermont history that was full of big changes to begin with, and the bike was an interesting protagonist in a lot of those changes. Um, but before we get there, uh, you have in your hands this little guide, and in this, this talk, well, that's yours to keep. That's your souvenir for the day. Um, but there's a little field guide to 19th century bicycles in there. And I think it's important, just so that we're all on the same page, because we're going to talk about these things, that we're all on the same page about what were these objects. And um, so very quick, very quick uh, story. In uh, eight, you've heard of the year without summer, 1815, uh, 1816, sorry. And uh, in that year, including in Vermont, you know, harvests failed. And in Germany, there was a nobleman named Karl von Dres who was worried about the horses that were dying. And he had long held dreams of creating a horseless carriage. And he invented and then introduced the very next year a thing called a Dresin, uh, also called a velocipede. And it was a running machine, or a Lauf machine, he called it as well. And you would get on it, and it was, had wagon wheels, and it was this big, sort of cumbersome piece of carved wood and you would sort of run and then when you got going fast you would kick your feet up and rest them on, a, uh, on these little foot rests. Uh, the steering was super primitive so good luck um, getting out of the rut that you were on because the roads were terrible. Um, but they were, they were quite popular in Paris and in London even in New York uh, for the next decade or so. Uh, and they were associated with dandies, um, you know, these young, fashionable men. And so they were also known as dandy chargers. So those things, though, they're, 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 they're very small scale kind of excitement associated with them. And then in the 1860s, a broken down Draisin shows up in a Paris wagon wheel shop. Uh, and an enterprising tinkerer there by the name of Pierre Lallemant uh, decides to put a crank on and pedals on the front wheel, right? So it's no longer a running machine. It's now something that is, has a pedal and cranks. He tried it out. He liked it. Other people liked it. And so uh, he uh, basically, in his wagon wheel shop, along with some his colleagues, create what is known as the Velocipede. It's also known as the Bone Shaker because these things were 150 pounds. They were you know, super rigid and you, the roads and cobblestones would shake your bones as you were riding these things around. Um, and uh, this object has serious limits. First of all, they get uh, banned in places like Central Park immediately. People are really concerned about these things. But they become circus um, acts. They're involved in circus acts and so on. But people who take up these things are excited for them and they want to go faster. And so the way you go faster on a direct drive uh, vehicle is you grow that front wheel. And so this is the transition to the so-called high wheeler or the ordinary or the penny farthing. There's lots of names for those particular bicycles. But this is a moment of great technological innovation because to, you move from wagon wheels to spoked wheels that are being held in tension. And that lightens them up tremendously. And then you're starting to get, use steel tubing, and the tubing is being bent, and so it involves different manufacturing processes. So there's a huge explosion of excitement around this particular bicycle. 
But here's the secret, not so secret. They're super dangerous <laughs> and they're super hard to ride. <laughs> And it takes a lot of practice and, and what they called um, sportiness, uh, which is athleticism, to be able to master these things. And, uh, and the term header, in fact, comes from this. You know, the idea that you fly over the head of your, your uh, bicycle when you hit a bump. And so these were not super um, widespread. They were very expensive uh, as well. And so the inventor of this design actually then in the 1880s creates this design which is called the safety bicycle and that's a common expression you will hear today as we get into the story here in Vermont. There, there were lots of safety bicycles here and um, you know it's, we're very familiar with that same design because it's more or less what we have today. Um, and they were pretty bumpy until 1888 when the pneumatic tire was invented by Dr. John Dunlop, who was an Irish doctor whose son loved bicycles, but was sickly, as they said, and he didn't like the bumps, and so he invented the pneumatic tire for his son. So that's the technology. We're going we're gonna to hear about three of these um, here in Vermont uh, as we go. So in the late 1860s, and by the way, this is a new part of my talk, thanks to Corinne and the invitation here. I haven't paid much attention to the story of the velocipede. But the, there, the, I had seen reports of a velocipede craze in Montpelier in 1869. And in um, St. Albans, I knew this for a while, there was a velocipede riding school. Of course, no one knew how to ride these things. And so they would cr take over skating rinks and they would ride around in them. In, in St. Albans, there are reports of parades on the streets of St. Albans on velocipedes. They were really quite popular there. So they took, uh, a guy took over the Darrow Concert Hall and turned it into a velocipede riding school um, in 1869. So these were circus vehicles for the most Americans who maybe even heard of these, because most people hadn't. Um, but uh, we had them here in Vermont pretty much immediately. Now, mind you, the velocipede is invented in, in basically 1866 or so. And three years later, they're showing up in Vermont. And they're being built here. This is the interesting thing, right? So um, uh, they were being built here in what was then Berlin, now Montpelier, after 1899, at the Montpelier Carriage Company. Um, the origins of that story are actually in Waterbury. There was a company called Colby and Brothers that got established in the 1850s to create children's carriages, and they started producing this, this three-wheeled velocipede. Um, in 1869, they sold their children's carriage division and the velocipede division to the Montpelier Carriage Company, which eventually became Montpelier Manufacturing Company. Um, and so by 1874, about 10,000 of these uh, boys Velocipedes had been made here in this area and mostly sent to Boston and New York where they were, there were agents who were de you know, dealing these things and they were very well known and uh, quite popular. Um, but there's an interesting story about the patents and this, this is like one of those historical flash in the pans that is really tra uh, changes history in important ways and it happened right here uh, and is associated with the Montpelier manufacturing uh, company. So the story in super brief is that, that there were sort of two patents um, put on the Velocipede. The first, in the 1860s, in 1862, there was a guy named Philip McKenzie who created this sort of hobby horse thing and it w w could be mounted and there was um, sort of a pedaling mechanism where a, a child could sort of, you know, push their way along, initially just push their way along and then it became offset, right? Um, and uh, these things were being produced by a guy named Smith in New York City. He, and so Smith held the patent for a long time. He, this guy Smith sells the patent to the Montpelier Manufacturing Company. Somehow uh, Montpelier shows up and says, we want to take that Velocipede that we're making and we want to own the patent so we don't get sued by you and your heirs when you die and you know so because we're, we're, we're using the same technology as this McKenzie thing. Um, so they buy it and um, 
they don't do much with it until about 1877. Turns out there's a company in Ohio that's producing these things, children's velocipedes, and so they sue and they win. It's a patent violation. So Montpelier starts receiving royalties from this Ohio company. So that's half the story here. The other half of the story, though, is that guy Pierre Lalemant, who invented the bone shaker, he also took out a patent. He came to Connecticut in 1866, and he took out a US patent on his design. So we have two basically steering, uh, steerable vehicles that are powered by the feet, right? They both have patents on them. And one of the funny things about our patent system back then is that companies would sort of look at what their competitors were doing, and then they could change their patent description. So suddenly, the Lalamont patent, des patent description and the McKenzie patent description are changing, and they're starting to look like the exact same thing. <laughs> they're all referring to a steerable vehicle powered by the feet. But the Lalamont patent is owned by a Boston company. So what happens? Montpelier and Boston create a cartel where any velocipede made in the United States has to pay royalties to this cartel. So it's really interesting, right? Vermont is the home of the first bicycle cartel, right? <laughs> so this lasts a few years. But for the most part, the velocipede craze didn't go too, too long. It was a children, the children were still doing it, but no one was really producing velocipedes by the mid-1870s. And then in 1876, in Philadelphia is the World's Exposition. And it's the same year, or we're not long after these bikes, these high wheel bikes are being made. And they show up in Philadelphia. And people are super excited for them. And a guy named Colonel Albert Pope, who was a brevet colonel in the Civil War from Boston, goes there and he's really blown away at the potential industrial commercial possibilities of this new bicycle. So he buys them <laughs> from the English, like literally from the English uh, exhibit, exhibit at the World <laughs> Exhibition. He's like, I want those. So he buys them and he skedaddles to uh, Hartford, Connecticut, where there's sewing machine factories. And sewing machine factories can do precision manufacturing. And he, he goes to one and he says, I want you to make this exact thing. <laughs> So they do, and they start selling, and they start selling like hotcakes. This is around 1877, 1878. But here's the thing, the cartel is saying, guess what, Pope? You're, you're using our patented design, a steerable vehicle powered by the feet. And so Pope is literally, by 1879, he's literally paying 27.50 per bike to, to Vermont and to Boston. And so Pope was, had visions of a monopoly. He wanted the monopoly. So he sent his father to Montpelier and put him up in a hotel. And the father made many visits to Montpelier Manufacturing Company to sort of entice them to sell the patent. And eventually Montpelier did. They, they gave in. Their business model was beginning to shift. They were not interested in velocipedes. They weren't planning to build more. And so then Richardson McKee down in Boston was like, well, what's the point of being a cartel if your partner in the cartel isn't in it anymore? So they sell it all to Pope. And Pope locks down the bicycle industry. And, be, and this is, the bike industry loved patents. And he enforced a very aggressively, introduces a whole new era of patent, patenting the silliest little changes, the you know, and enforcing those patents is very aggressively. So Pope basically, who founded the Columbia Bicycle Company, some of you might have had Columbia Bicycles, uh, is uh, he begins the American bicycle industry basically on the basis of acquiring these patents. So that's the Montpelier, you'll hear more about Montpelier Berlin uh, Berry as we go, but that's the, the interesting sort of setting for a lot of this. So by the 1880s, oops, sorry, wheeling, as they called it in Vermont, is, is becoming known. And uh, this is uh, C.G. or Nellie Ross from Rutland. Uh, he was a very typical uh, 1880s wheelman, they called themselves. They wore uniforms. They rode in military formations. They, 
had buglers and they had captains and they had sergeants and uh, they would parade a lot. Uh, and uh, they were riding around on these high wheels, which were very expensive, about six months' wages for the typical um, worker. So these were elite men, um, and they, um, like Nellie Ross here, his father was the, the manager, or the president of the Lincoln Iron Works in Rutland, and he eventually assumed that position himself. So these bicycles were rare, they were, but they created a big spectacle and it was uh, wealthy men who were riding them. By the 1890s, in the period we now call the bicycle craze, um, bicycles become much more accessible. The safety bicycle is now the prominent design, and women are taking to the bicycle and with enthusiasm. The roads are getting much, much better because of the pressures and advocacy of the wheelmen's groups. Um, and the um, the excitement around the bicycle just explodes um, uh, all over and families are getting in on it and men and women are going on bicycle parties as that, those from Lindenville and Bellas Falls, that's what they were called. So the bicycle really explodes in that period and just a small piece or indication of that is that in Burlington in the 1890s there were 10 bicycle shops. <laughs> If you can imagine, this is a city with double the population now, and we have like five bicycle you know, dealers. But there were 10 in that decade, and everyone was getting in on the bicycle business. Uh, you could go to Hager's Hardware, where you could pick up your harnesses and trimmings for your horses, but also you could pick up a bicycle. You could go to Lane's Bicycle Livery, where you could not just buy a bike, you as a visitor could rent a bike. Uh, for a few days uh, or just a day um, and then you could go to the electrical supply store <laughs> and in the back they had their um, bicycle department and one of my favorites is the jeweler on Church Street. L.M. March was selling diamonds, watches, clocks, jewelry and optical goods and bicycles, right? So <laughs> bicycles were um, very, very big in that decade. So big, they called it a bicycle mania. The latest disease, bicycle mania, we all have it. That's a comic from 1897. Uh, and what I love about this particular comic is it captures the ways in which the bicycle so in infiltrated people's imaginations that they were renaming things along the lines of the bicycle. So, um, you know, bi cures bicyclist diseases. You know, there was a whole, ca you'll, you'll hear more about this. There were a whole category of diseases that were thought to be caused by bicycling. Um, bicycle liniment, drink bicycle soda, bicycle tonic, sprocket hall, eat bicycle food, right? The, the, in, in, there's a really interesting way in which the, the slang language of everyday life was being repurposed in ways that used bicycle terms, right? So, so when you would say, oh, uh, um, I need a pump up, that was what people would say, I need a pump up. That was obviously pumping up your tire, but it meant that you were tired and hungry, right? So the bicycle was this, suddenly this huge craze, and people are really grappling with it. This is not just a fad, right? This is the part of the interesting story about the bicycle, is that, you know, 10 years after this comic is made, the bicycle is no longer in the place of main, maniacal position in society. People aren't paying as much attention to the bicycle. There's some good reasons for that. The car is beginning to emerge and so on. But it wasn't just this sort of one-off fad. It was, the bicycle uh, craze was involved in some really durable and consequential changes in our society that we take for granted today. One of those is probably something you experienced on the way here, which was effortless speed, right? The idea that you can get in a vehicle and it will take you somewhere fast without you know, putting much effort into it. The bicycle was the first experience that people had of that. They had horses, obviously, but horses get tired. You have to feed them. They break down, <laughs> right? Uh, they had trains, of course, but trains had a reputation of swallowing you up. You didn't have control. You were just seeding yourself to the, their schedule and so on. 
Um, but the bicycle is sort of this object that allows people to really test their bodies in new ways and to push themselves. And uh, so there was a real fascination in particular with speed. And the whole 1890s was obsessed with the experience of speed. And so, um, so you know, th again, these are things we take for granted today. Another element of this story is that, you know, I told you a little bit about the first beginnings of manufacturing. Well, what Pope and other manufacturers do by the 1890s is they create a cutting edge American industry that um, is thought to be the, the, the highest expression of industrial uh, creativity and production uh, uh, processes. So in Hartford, um, Connecticut, Pope had hired Thomas Edison to uh, create a 24-7 assembly line, electrified with lights and so on, to do bicycle production in the mid-1890s. And a young Henry Ford, who was a bike mechanic, went on a junket to Hartford, paid for by Columbia Bicycles, to experience this. It clearly made a difference in his imagination of how you might build a car someday, right? He did assembly line, and he saw that for the first time in Hartford. They were innovating techniques of bending steel. The ball bearing was invented for the bicycle. Uh, so the bicycle plays this really important role technologically in the rise of the automobile. It, the very first bicycle companies became automobile companies. Pope was a good, you know, Columbia started making automobiles by the late 1890s. Um, uh, and also legally, and uh, the bike paved the way for the automobile. It, uh, they needed ordinances, they needed traffic laws to manage the bicycles that were suddenly populating the streets. And the bicycle, uh, sorry, the automobile just sort of assumed a lot of those legal statuses that the bikes once had. It, ch it challenged gender relations. We'll hear some of that today, that women uh, found the bicycle to be a tool for their own liberation and emancipation, a challenge to the clothing that they had to wear, uh, to find no looser clothing. So there was a gender politics, and the, uh, there's no um, better illustration of this than prominent suffragists were very pro-bicycle. Right, uh, so there was that. And then there was the last piece, which is ideas about leisure were really changing in this time. People are finally having opportunities for systematic leisure, the weekend, things like that. And so bicycles become wrapped up in that. And so we see the early beginnings of what we now call sort of landscape tourism, as people from Boston and New York ride their bikes up to Vermont so they can see the beautiful landscapes, they can take photographs, they can sketch them, and so on. So the beginnings of a kind of tourism economy in Vermont have bicycles wrapped up in all of that. So there's also a dark side to all this, right? Bicycles were, very, they caused all kinds of commotion in cities, especially where the rules weren't clear about how they fit into the mix of, of, of pedestrian and horse transportation. Um, religious leaders were especially concerned about bicycles because on Sunday morning people are starting to ride bicycles instead of going to church. And there was uh, one prominent uh, 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 leader of uh, the Women's Rescue League, her name was Charlotte Smith, who um, had heard about a, a bike ride on a Sunday called a Bicycle Run for Christ. And so she wrote an editorial that was nationally circulated that said, this should be called the bicycle run for Satan, right? Because this, because Satan is just behind the, 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 the women taking to the bicycle, right? And then there were all these diseases that, that were playing out too. People were really, they had, they were experiencing something that they didn't really ever experience, which were certain kinds of aches and pains. You know, there, there was a phenomenon called bicycle hands. You know, we even, if you ride a, bicycle, you know it, right? Your hands get numb and tingly and so on. And then there were more interesting ones. There was one called Kyphosis bicyclistarum. It was this literally categorized as a humpback situation that you would get from riding too much. Another one was bicycle face. You can, there's a, where is it? It's up here somewhere, like cures bicycle. Oh yeah, bicycle face cured right up in the center top. Bicycle face was this really funny kind of thing where the, your face got stuck in a contorted position from trying to balance the bike 
or because you were going too fast on the bike. And so, uh, and what's really interesting was this was targeted at women. More women are taking to the bike and conservative male doctors are saying, you know what, it's going to make you ugly. You shouldn't be out there on a bicycle, right? <laughs> so there was a lot of controversy and so on. So anyway, what's this talk? We haven't even gotten into the Vermont talk, right? So the way this works is I've sort of organized this talk in three sections to give you a sense of how this is all playing out here. The wheelmen, who were these men that were involved in bicycling? How did they organize bicycling in themselves and so on? The new woman, because the ways in which the bicycle was appropriated by new women of the 1890s. And then good roads, because the roads really were terrible, but bicycle riders played a central, critical role in making them better. Okay, so we'll start with the wheelmen. This is the Bicycle Club of Swanton in 1893. And at the time, beginning in the 1880s, when people started riding the high wheels and then even into the safety era, the appropriate way to ride a bicycle was in a recreational setting with your peers. And it was meant to be an orderly activity. It was a very social activity. Um, and so the idea of just getting on your bike by yourself and riding off was not initially, at least, a very common theme. So men organize themselves into wheelmen's clubs. And uh, Vermont saw uh, some of the very earliest wheelmen's clubs in the United States. Um, the first was founded in 1878, the Boston Bicycle Club. Uh, and in 1880, there was one founded in Brattleboro. And so it's considered to be the second that was founded in the United States. Um, uh, even before the um, League of American Wheelmen, which was a national organization, was founded. So the Vermont Wheel Club, um, they changed their names. They started as the Brattleboro Wheel Club in 1880. But by 1885, they're the Vermont Wheel Club. This is a club of the elites of uh, Brattleboro. The, you didn't even have to have a bicycle to join. You had to be an upstanding male citizen. Uh, and it was a very wealthy club. They built, they had a building built for them that had very, it was very, very finely appointed in that kind of, you know, excessively rich uh, Victorian way. And they would host visiting wheelmen, they would host banquets, they would, they had their own um, uh, design, the winged wheel symbol that they put on everything, on their silverware, on their plates, on their stationery. Um, and they were more than a wheel club, as I say, because they weren't just riding bicycles. They, had a, they sponsored a baseball team called the Vermont Wheel Club Baseball Team. Um, and if you were anybody in Vermont politics in the, that era of the 1880s and 90s, you would make the trek every winter down to their winter ball because that was where there was serious wealth and there was seriously influential people. Because remember, Brattleboro is tied into the Connecticut River Valley Industrial Corridor. So, you know, these are very influential business connections that they have. They're also the corridor that people come up, the wheelmen are coming up as they enter Vermont. And so, for the most part. And so, uh, their first stop is the Vermont Wheel Club. Super influential. Um, and, uh, and quite elaborate. Now in Burlington, in the mid-1880s, we see the Burlington Wheel Club form. And those, the members of that, that's, they're standing in front of the Fletcher Free Library where it once was, which you probably know, it's where City Hall is, or BCA is now. Um, the, these were Burlington's elites. They were uh, the publisher of the Burlington Free Press. They were the you know, doctors and lawyers and so on. But what's so interesting is that you can see, you know, the Wheel Club was basically around 1886. That's when they formed and they didn't last long. Whereas the Vermont Wheel Club lasted until 1924. It's like, why? Why did that one last so long and this one was so short? Well, in 1887, the Lake Champlain Yacht Club was founded. And all these guys who were, who were gaining status, because these are very expensive vehicles, and very hard to master. You needed a lot of free time to master these things. They just say, like, well, forget about it. I'm going to go buy a yacht, and that's going to be my tool to status, right? So, um, so clearly, these, these early wheelmen were elite networks, and they were 
um, exercising to, for the world their high status by taking to these bicycles. They were thought to be very progressive. Here's an interesting example. This is um, Joseph Ald, a pretty prototypical wheelman of the 1880s. He was the publisher of the Burlington Free Press. And um, he wrote a book called uh, Picturesque Burlington in 1893. And it barely makes mention of bicycles, but it very clearly is influenced by a bicyclist's sensibilities because it's all about landscape appreciation. It's the sort of the first tour guidebook to Burlington. But it's not about what's in downtown Burlington. It's like, what's on the lakeside? And where the, go right out towards the mountains and get pretty views and so on. And that's exactly what these wheelmen were doing, is they were sort of, another way to show their status was they were sort of early environmental thinkers, right? Yeah. Uh, what was the average mileage of one of their outings? These guys would go anywhere, on the high wheels, they would go anywhere from 10 miles to 50 miles. Um, and they would push the hills? They would push the hills. Wow. And they were terrible roads, as you'll see. So it's a, quite a feat. You know, uh, but that's not every single rider, right? And, a, and a, uh, one of the things that Burlington became famous for was people would bring their high wheels on trains to Burlington and ride on what were known as the sandpapered streets of Burlington, because Burlington had bought a stone crusher in 1873. <laughs> And so they had macadamized streets. Macadam is just a road surface of rocks, t fine rocks with oil. So the streets were really good for riding these high wheels. So people would travel to Burlington to ride. Um, so um, Joseph Wald was also a tinkerer. This is the other interesting thing about this early, the early bike scene is like full of people who are messing with things. You know, they're, so Ald gets a patent for a tricycle gearing system in 1883. Um, he never seemed to do anything with it. Um, but, you know, people were always adding things, trying new things. Um, some, I heard the word, the name Glenn Ames come up earlier. And Glenn is a collector here in Vermont of, has a world-class collection of historic bicycles. And he, just looking at putting five bicycles together from the same era, you'll see very different designs. People were trying out lots of things. Um, and, uh, and eventually they just started adding com internal combustion engines and they started adding electric motors. And you know, the next thing you know, we have motorcycles and cars, right? So, um, so that's Joseph Ald. Um, in Rutland, uh, they also were early adopters in, uh, of the bicycle. They were founded in 1881, the Rutland Bike Cl Bicycle Club. And there's a unique relationship between wheelmen and skating rinks. And wheelmen loved skating rinks because they could uh, have a nice soft surface year round to ride their bikes. They could do tricks. They loved to do tricks. Um, and they could rent out the skating rink uh, for concerts and things like that uh, when they weren't using it. And so um, in where this played out, they would usually just buy a skating rink, right? They're wealthy men. They would just buy it. Well, in Rutland, they decided to build one. And uh, it opened on July 4th, 1884. It cost $15,000, which is roughly $400,000, $500,000 in our money today. It had 1,200 seats, numerous gas chandeliers. And it, uh, this, is the, this was, for me, this was like the big mystery of Vermont bicycle history that only I cared about for the longest time. I was like, why did the next year the thing sold for $2,325, right? So they spent, they put all this money into it and then the next year they sell it at auction for 2,300 bucks. So it turns out that they had to get a loan. They, you know, these were wealthy guys, but they had to get a loan. And um, uh, someone in the clerk's office in Rutland uh, had screwed up the collateral that, and the value of the collateral that they put up and uh, word eventually got to one of the suppliers, and the supplier immediately slapped a lien down on that, on that property. And so the, the Wheelman's Club was like, what are we gonna do? And so they put it up for auction uh, and got hardly anything for it. Um, and in fact, uh, after this last hurrah in 1885, they, went down to, they rode down to Springfield, uh, Massachusetts. They disbanded, they're like, screw it. <laughs> We're done with the bicycle. We don't want to be part of this terrible thing. But it was quite a, spectac a spectacle, this skating rink. 
Um, down in uh, Bellows Falls, the Mount Kilburn Wheel Club was a very prominent wheel club in the state. Uh, they, their, their president was a guy named H.D. Ryder, and he was a prominent lawyer here in Vermont. And he loved to use the Wheelman's Club um, to uh, hold mock court trials. So the Wheelman's Club wasn't just go for bike rides, they would have these evening entertainments where they would have more mock court trials. In this case, this is from 1894, it's announcing an, a trial of a, of a, a, a townsperson uh, one of our most respected citizens will be tried for the larceny of a Plymouth Rock rooster. And uh, they promised, you know, aside from the rare fun of the occasion, uh, the entertainment will be exceedingly interesting to ladies and others who have never attended a real trial. So they did a lot. They had comic operas and plays and things like that. Um, whoop, sorry. And in the, in the Upper Valley, another, you know, intense center of wheeling activity. Um, Woodstock was kind of at the heart of that, and they hosted a parade, and I'll read you what's up here, so you probably can't see it super well, but there's a picture of the parade on the left in 1895, um, and there were many, many wheelmen's clubs in the Upper Valley into New Hampshire that would meet together, and in this particular day, they all met in Woodstock, and uh, this is uh, what the, was reported in the newspaper. A bicycle meet and parade under the auspices of the Wabino Cycle Club was held at Woodstock last Friday afternoon and evening and was a brilliant and successful affair. Stores and residences were elaborately decorated and in the evening the entire village was beautifully illuminated by over 3,000 Japanese lanterns. You can actually see the lanterns in that picture. The Hartford and Lebanon cycle clubs and cyclists from adjoining towns were present, the Woodstock Railway Company running a special tram. About 200 wheels were in line and the parade was witnessed by several thousand people. There was a fine display of fireworks in the evening. Woodstock cornet band discoursed music and refreshments were served to all cyclists and visiting friends in the town hall. But you know, imagine that, the excitement of a bicycle parade on a, just, you know, a random evening, you know, thousands of people turn out for this and several hundred people come from uh, nearby towns to ride to parade on their bikes downtown. Um, and a parade could draw as many as 500 people uh, in Woodstock. Woodstock plays an interesting uh, little bit role, again, this sort of sidebar kind of bike history fun story. Um, this is a, a photo of a, guy's, a guy named James Murdoch's house. He was a pharmacist uh, in Woodstock, and this photo is otherwise unremarkable until you notice what th is in the background. And that bicycle is a transition between that unsafe high wheeler and the safety bicycle. And this bike was the bike to have between 1880 and 1884. <laughs> so, like, if you wanted the very best bicycle that money could buy, this was it. It was kind of interesting because it was a treadle bicycle. You can sort of see the crank system. It's a treadle. So it wasn't pedals circling. It was treadles, back and forth, back and forth. Anyway, the very first bicycle to uh, go down Mount Washington was one of these, if you can imagine that. Um, but anyway, what does this have to do with Woodstock? Well. Um, the H.B. Uh, Smith Machine Company was the manufacturer of that bicycle. It was called the Star Rider. This, by the way, is John Stout, who was kind of the Tiger Woods of his era of bicycle tricks. And he, that's him riding down the Michigan State Capitol steps on one of these to show how, well, how good he is, but also how safe they are, right? Anyway, H.B. Smith manufactured these things in uh, Smithville, New Jersey. However, H.B. Smith was from Woodstock, Vermont, and he, as a young man, started a, a, a manufacturing company in Woodstock where he created uh, fine woodworking equipment. And he was so successful that he bought a township in New Jersey uh, where he would expand his business. And out of the blue one day, uh, an inventor shows up with this design of the Star Rider bicycle and says, sir, um, you have the kind of equipment I think that can make this bicycle. Would you like to go into business with me? And H.B. Smith was like, sure, why not? I like bicycles. 
So they ended up working together and H.B. Smith sold thousands of these things. Um, he didn't stay in the bike business for too long because his real business was wood working manufacturing uh, equipment. There were some bicycles that actually that were made in Vermont, um, not many. Uh, the Bennington Bicycle Company had uh, two models, the Tiffany Special or the Nelson Special. I once saw a Nelson Special on eBay for 400 bucks. I should have bought it. It was messed up. I mean, it was like, you know, it was 100 and something years old. Um, uh, the Coolidge Cycle Company in Rutland, they had two models, the Rutland model or the Vermont model. Um, uh, there, were, there was uh, the Howe bicycle was made in Rutland, and then in St. Johnsbury there was a guy named George Payne who was making bicycles. They were not, this was not a widespread industry. The real heart of the bicycle industry was in Connecticut until it moved out west to Chicago. Now, what about central Vermont? This is your story here in Montpelier, Barrie, Berlin. There were wheelmen's clubs here. The Capital uh, Cycle Club was founded in 1893. The Barry Bicycle Club was renowned for producing great racers. And uh, they hosted a lot of races. And they, they in fact, they were the home of a, of a uh, the home club of a guy who was known throughout New England as the Vermont Flyer. <laughs> His name was Ed Walsh. Um, and I, I just found this fun tidbit recently. An extra, they were holding a race, the Barry Bicycle Club. An extra attraction of a balloon ascension and a parachute jump, jump on a bicycle is advertised by the Barry Bicycle Club at their annual tournament, Saturday next. Um, and in um, and Barry and Montpelier and obviously Berlin cyclists were coming together on a regular basis. There was a parade that was held in Montpelier in 1896. And this is a fun tidbit. Corinne has it as well. I found it a long time ago. But it describes a, a parade with 226 riders in the, in the parade. Uh, and they, and the, the rider who is reporting this notes that there were about 100 people who he, everyone knew weren't there. So he's projecting about 350 or so bicycles in the area. Um, but he assessed the value of the bicycles in the parade. And he said it, was worth, it would be about $32,500 of bicycles were in that parade. And that's equivalent to about a million dollars today. So, you know, a typical bicycle, a good bicycle was $125 or so at that time. That's about $3,000 today. So, you know, these were, these were serious investments that people were making, and, and people marveled at the bike economy. Um, you, you probably would have gone to J.J. Williams' uh, bicycle shop in Montpelier if you were to buy a bicycle around here. Um, he wasn't the only one, but he was one of the real prominent dealers of uh, the fine bicycles. Um, but there are limits to the enthusiasm, or I should say uh, who is allowed to ride a bicycle. Um, this is a report from the Montpelier Evening Argus in July 1898 called City Charges on Wheels. It has been hinted that some of the city charges are riding bicycles. Overseer of poor George Wheeler was asked if it was true that individuals assisted by the city had succumbed to the attractions of the wheel. And he said that he had been informed that one or two women he had been helping had been seen riding bicycles, but that the city had not furnished the money for the wheels. One of the women, when asked about it, said that one of her neighbors had rented a wheel and permitted her to ride it. The pauper department has no objections to supplying the needy, but draws the line on luxuries like bicycles. <laughs> There's obviously a class politics to this, right? You know, bicycles are for middle class, upper middle class, upper crust kinds of people. They're not for the poor, right? So this is still in that era where, you know, bicycles are a symbol of being a kind of elite in our society. Um, so what did wheelmen do? They promoted orderly riding. Um, there was a, they, they would make lots of pronouncements about how you should ride. Always keep to the right. Always keep your wheel clean in passing another rider or vehicle. Keep to the right. Keep off crowded streets unless you have urgent business there. Don't forget that pedestrians have rights. It often saves bitter thoughts. <laughs> the, uh, the, the newspapers were full of these kinds of, 
you know, sage words for cyclists. Um, they consumed a lot of attention. Something that's rather interesting is that about 10% of the advertisements in bicycle, uh, I'm sorry, in newspapers in the 1890s were bicycle ads. And 10%. So that's a lot. And one historian says that was just enough of a push that many newspapers shifted from subscriber-driven funding model to an advertiser-driven funding model. So the bike industry was pretty prominent in the newspapers. The other thing that was happening is that people had to figure out how to get along with these bicycles, and wheelmen were right in the thick of all that. Um, and so here's an interesting article from the, uh, the United Opinion in Bradford in 1895. It's called Cycling Etiquette. Every sport has its rules of etiquette, and a system of exchange of courtesies must be adapted to cycling conditions. A question that is causing a great deal of agitation relates to the mode of greeting among wheelmen and wheelwomen. Shall a man take his hand from the handlebar at the risk of taking a header in order to tip his cap, or shall he merely nod, and he nod his head and say howdy? Shall a lady make a sweeping courtesy or merely nod? Instances are cited wherein men have tried to do that which they have been taught from childhood, and the result has been a hectic flush all over one side of their faces, where the skin was caressed by the loving but somewhat calloused hand of Mother Earth. <laughs> Ladies who have bowed too profoundly have been picked up tenderly by helping hands after it was all over. It is with reason, therefore, that cyclists are giving this matter serious consideration. So. So you wanted to be predictable, right? And uh, uh, the other thing that wheelmen did, they loved to do, was race, right? They organized races. Um, this is about a bicycle race uh, here in Montpelier. Um, uh, it was between Barry and Montpelier. And the winner uh, is this guy, um, uh, Fred Sherburn. So the bicycle race to Montpelier in return last Thursday attracted a large crowd at the start and finish. Uh, William Holden, Edward Clark, Fred Sherburn, George Wheeler, William Reynolds, and Frank Gurley were the starters, and they returned in the following order. Sherburn, Gurley, Clark, Wheeler, Holden, and Reynolds. The last named wears his leather medal with becoming modesty. <laughs> Sherburn, covered the, Sherburn covered the 12 miles in 63 minutes. So that is averaging out to about 16 miles per hour. Now, you know the hills around here. You know that this is a single-speed bicycle. You know that there aren't gears, right? You know that they're, they're, these are not freewheel bicycles either. So, was, it, did, was it in the valley from basically? The this valley? is from Barry to Montpelier. So, so. Right. Was it over like the hill, or was it in through the valley? It doesn't describe the route, right? Yeah. So. It, but what goes up must come down, <laughs> right? So, but this is actually this is not slow by any stretch. What you see in a lot of race reports are averages of about 20 miles per hour. And there's, there's one in Burlington that goes down from Burlington, basically Church Street, down to Winooski Bridge. And so if you know that, that's a pretty substantial hill. And the winner made it averaging, averaging 20 miles per hour. So people were really athletic, and they were moving really fast on these bicycles. Sherburn was a real champ. Um, Sherburn was a unique character in bicycle world. He was from Barrie, and he had, uh, for a time, he, ha he had a bicycle agency. He sold bicycles in Barrie. Um, for a time, he owned a, a photography studio as well, and he sold photographic equipment. And he's one of these interesting characters that brings these two worlds together. Both of these worlds, photography and bicycles, were brand new and exciting for people. And uh, he brought them together. And um, uh, so anyway, Sherburn, we think that Sherburn, Glenn and Ames and I have many mysteries we try and solve together. And we think that that's Sherburn right there um, getting his photograph taken. The other thing that Wheelman did was they loved to sh have feats of endurance. And so um, this is about a ride in 1894 of two crack Woodstock Wheelmen. Uh, so they started Saturday, Sunday morning, this is in Woodstock, at 2.30 a.m., and they rode to Littleton, New Hampshire, a distance of 83 miles, and their idea was they would stop there, have dinner, and then return to Woodstock. Um, they, decide, they arrived at 10.30 a.m., and then they uh, wired their friends 
Um, instead of returning, uh, they decided to keep riding into New Hampshire and St. Johnsbury, um, where they arrived 1.30 a.m. on Monday morning. Um, so they keep going, and by the time they arrived back in Woodstock, they'd ridden 158 miles in 23 hours. And they took a short rest, and then they had ridden, sorry, so and then they had ridden another 52 miles home. So this is what the newspapers were fascinated with. <laughs> People pushing their bodies in new ways um, with the bicycle. This was newsworthy stuff. But here's the problem. There were certain men who were not really invited into the wheelmen's clubs. They were often working class men and, uh, or women, because there, there were women's clubs as well. And they were known as scorchers. And the scorcher was a, a menace to the ordered world of the, of the wheelmen. Because the scorchers didn't ride in formation. They would often ride through town riding fast. And here's the story from Burlington. And it, it begins ominously. Another accident occurred Tuesday evening as a direct result of the ever-present bicycle scorcher. Um, and it just describes how uh, a bike mechanic at this shop, um, this is Lane site Bicycle Livery, uh, was scorching on Loomis Street, presumably in front of the shop here. And he runs over a boy of eight or nine, Barney Buxton. Barney Buxton gets knocked down. He's locked, knocked unconscious. And they call Dr. Lyman. And uh, Barney wakes up eventually and can't remember what happened to him. This is just a typical story of the day, but it's the, it's the tip of an iceberg of sorts, of the, the problem of a different riding style in the city. I mean, you know, I live in Burlington, college students on bikes, zipping along wherever you, you know, wherever you turn. You've got to be careful, right? So this, has been, this was especially thought to be a problem all over Vermont, whether it was a small town or a bigger city. Scorchers were considered to be a menace. Um, so wheelmen tried to get out ahead, and they tried to make regulations. And so by 1897, 98, including here in both Barrie and Montpelier, bicycle ordinances were passed. But before that, there weren't bicycle ordinances. You couldn't ride on sidewalks in many towns, but no one enforced it, so people did it. But this is um, this is from the Bellows Falls Times, and. This is a, about a proposal of the Mount Kilburn wheelmen for a regulation. There has been considerable complaint of fast and reckless riding. It is better that the wheelmen take the matter in hand themselves. They didn't want to be regulated, right? So they thought, well, let's propose what we can live with. We suggest all wheelmen carry lanterns and bells and keep to the right side of the street or on such bicycle paths as hereafter may be provided. So these ordinances are they're very familiar to us today. You need to have lights. You've got to stay off the sidewalks. You have to have a bell, right? There's speed limits. So they had speed limits on bicycles even back then. So, um, so in a way, they did get out ahead of it. They helped shape the kinds of you know, ordinances that were created. Um, the, just a side note on the bicycle paths. Um, so there was this whole vision. There was this, and for, for bike advocates, it's like this delicious moment in American history uh, in the late 1800s when the plan just that was beginning to emerge all over this country was to connect towns by bike paths. And they started constructing many, many, many bike paths. Not so much in Vermont. There was only one that was constructed here between Lindenville and St. John Johnsbury. One was proposed here between Montpelier and Barrie. Um, and, uh, but it, it, never, it didn't happen uh, here in Vermont because the state legislature was like, we aren't interested in that. Um, but the, the vision was that that was going to be intertown transportation, was going to be by bicycle. So this is all, of course, before the automobile. Um, so wheelmen were involved in legal issues all the time. <laughs> they, they, uh, uh, they were especially concerned about bicycle thievery. Um, uh, and in 1896, there was this fun little news item that says, it is next to impossible to safely steal a bicycle in Vermont. There was a two-year sentence in state prison if you, were, if you stole a bike. So that, that was, it was thought that, that would, this was the wheelman who got that law passed. Um, it didn't work, by the way. Uh, there were lots of reports of bicycle thievery happening. <laughs> in the 1890s. And this is just describes how George Ash, a bicycle thief, got a bike in White River Junction. 
He says it came from a college student, so probably somebody from Dartmouth because the bikes were big there. Uh, and he sold it in Chittenden County. What's interesting is the bike was worth $7 in that era, 1899. That'd be about $190 today. And he was thrown in to prison in Rutland for three months. He didn't get a full two-year sentence. But think about the, the preciousness of the bicycle. 190, in our money today, like a $190 bicycle gets you three months' time, right? That just doesn't happen today, right? Check out the New York Times piece on Burlington that's in today's paper. It's about bike thieving in Burlington right now. It's totally out of control. So moving on, the new woman. So the, the bicycle was super exciting to women, uh, in, in not just in, in other states, but especially here in Vermont. Um, and this is a fun little tidbit from the Londonderry Sifter in 1897. He, don't you think it rather risky to come so far alone on your wheel? She hadn't thought of it, but if you feel timid, I'll see you home. <laughs> so women, so the new woman is this sort of emblematic figure of the 1890s. It's the woman who's independent, who's physically active, who is self-reliant, and the kind of epitome of the reinvented uh, American woman, and um, has a certain kind of um, status in the community where um, people take her seriously as a contributor to society. And um, uh, so here in Vermont, we see um, a, a real assertion of the new woman. And you see it in other arenas, like a civic engagement in places like Burlington, where these same women who are involved with bicycles are asserting themselves in civic um, issues increasingly. Um, but the, the new woman was such an important figure for the suffragists and that relationship with the bicycle. I have to read you a quotation from um, one of the you know, most important suffragists, Elizabeth Cady Stanton. She says, the bicycle will inspire women with more courage, self-respect, and self-reliance and will make the next, the, the next generation more vigorous of mind and body. For feeble mothers do not produce great statesmen, scientists, and scholars. So there was a lot of attention in the Vermont papers about women and bicycles and columns. There was a pretty steady column in the Burlington Free Press called The Woman in the Wheel. And this was tidbits from an, one particular column. The coming woman will be the woman whose mother rode a bicycle and thereby made herself fit to be the mother of the coming woman, said, says Ida Trafford Bell. There are eight million bachelors in the United States. Watch the reduction in number as soon as the bicycle girl in bloomers is scattered over the land, says the American <laughs> wheelman. <laughs> um, and it creates uh, you know, new, new relationships that people had to work through. In the same way they're working through etiquette on the streets, they're also working through etiquette of how men and women are going to interact with each other in public ways or in commercial spaces. And this is a really fun little uh, a piece from the uh, Free Press that same year, 1895, called Selecting a Cycle Teacher. Most cycle depots will send up a man to teach any of their own customers, and many ladies have learned in this fashion. Personally, however, it seems to me that if one must clutch any male thing wildly by the neck and fall into his arms 10 or 20 times in the course of an afternoon, a relative or intimate friend is better than an unknown oily mechanic. And I should therefore counsel the girl who contemplates learning the safety to select her teacher with these unavoidable contingencies in full view. A lot of the emphasis around bicycles is what they did for women's bodies. And they were seen as a, an object that could help women become more physically active and have more control over their ability to exercise, which was a key element of at least the way uh, suffragists in Vermont were framing their political claims. Now, Vermont was very slow. In fact, it didn't happen until the, the amendment was passed in, what, 1920 that allowed women the right to vote. So that, it didn't land here in Vermont, the right to vote for women, in ways that it did in New York or Massachusetts. Part of the reason for that could be that by 19, sorry, by 1872, women had limited suffrage. They could vote in local elections, school boards, things like that. They could even serve. Um, 
there was also a sense in Vermont that um, women had their own independent source of power that was emerging, and it was economic power, uh, because they were controlling the tourism industry, the farm tourism industry, people coming to farms, staying there, and they were paying the wife. They were not paying the man. So, it, so women were, had a sense that, that they weren't quick to adopt suffragist politics. However, they were quick to acknowledge that physical activity for women was critical. So in 1892, there was a big conference in Montpelier here uh, on the rights of suffrage and the complete enfranch enfranchisement of women. And one of the central addresses given there was about the importance of women having control over their own bodies, right? And so the bicycle was wrapped up in that, and it was seen as a critical element of women being able to do that. Um, but again, their, their enthusiasm here in Vermont was fairly com you know, complex. This little tidbit from the Orleans County Monitor in 1895. Miss May June, do you believe in women's suffrage? Miss Jan Feb, well, er, I haven't quite come to that yet, but I ride a bicycle. <laughs> so they separated it, right? It's OK to ride a bicycle, but it, you don't necessarily have to have suffrage politics. Um, but you know, prominent women, these are the Wells sisters in um, Burlington on the right, uh, she, they, uh, General William Wells, this you know, hero of Gettysburg, this, these, this was his uh, wife and his uh, niece. Um, they would ride around Burlington on bicycles. And Daisy Stiles Hager there on the left, uh, another prominent Burlington family. Um, they, they were not known for their suffrage politics, but they were very clearly um, promoting civic engagement. Oops, sorry civic engagement and uh, riding bicycles. Where women and cycling intersected for, in the popular imagination was mostly around health debates. Uh, remember bicycle face, right? Bicycle face was seen as this thing that could make women ugly. So, so there was a lot of attention on women's bodies and trying to dissuade women from riding bikes because of the health impacts. Um, but anyway, some, there was two sides in this. One side said, you know, the best RX is a ride. Take it instead of going to the druggist. Um, bicycling hygiene, it was called hygiene. Hygiene was sort of sanitary living. Um, opens up the pores, which should be treated with ablutions of water. You should know how to breathe. Breathing through the mouth can cause heart troubles. Don't, uh, be sure your mouth doesn't get parched. It can affect digestion. Drink milk with a few drops of rum in it before a ride. So that was on the positive side. On the negative side, you have this kind of language. This is a very remarkable article that describes uh, a lecture by Dr. Heine Marx from uh, St. Louis. He was the superintendent of a hospital there. And he's denouncing bicycle riding. First, you have a kind of paralysis of the hands and contraction of the chest. This causes congestion of the lungs and leads to consumption. Now, just pause there. Consumption. We all know that's tuberculosis, right? So, you know, there's some grandiose claims here. Furthermore, with men, rupture, varicocele, hydrocele follow, and worst of all, it destroys virility. With women, riding promotes amorous desires. Married women are especially liable to very serious mishaps. <laughs> if the world is not depopulated by the rapidly increasing membership of this suicide club, the human race will die out by reason of lack of manhood and an inability to propagate. It was interesting, actually, uh, a, a, a doctor of nervous um, um, ailments at UVM medical school back then did bicycle research, interestingly enough. Um, I guess a predecessor of mine on the faculty in the 1890s. His name was Graham Hammond, and he, uh, he wrote an article basically saying, no, this is really good for women. Women should be riding bicycles. It, you know, don't take these threats seriously. They're really good for all kinds of purposes in, in a woman's life. Um, uh, so the medical establishment, though, is really deeply divided. And a lot of this was really um, largely about dissuading women from riding bicycles. Now what about the roads? This is our last part. Um, the roads, as you can see, really were terrible. <laughs> um, the way we did roads in Vermont um, uh, up until this era of you know, the 1890s, 1880s, was the towns were in charge of their roads. And one way you paid your taxes was you would go labor on the road. 
Uh, and the, 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 the legislature only set general guidelines for like keep stones out of the road. That, literally, that was one of the guidelines, like keep stones out of the road. But they didn't talk about anything like how wide a road needed to be, what materials to use, whatever. So the roads were really inconsistent and they were terrible. You know, they were muddy, they were stony, they were, and, and largely if it, weren't the, if it wasn't the taxpayers doing labor, it was the, the owner of the farm proximal to that road who dealt with it. And that often meant as they're preparing fields, just throwing rocks there that would get pounded down over time and so on. So now imagine yourself as a 1880s, 1890s wheelman. You're wealthy, you're entitled, and these roads suck. And so you're like, what am I going to do about that, right? So Wheelman got out really early in front of the road problem and began advocating for a whole different approach to how we deal with roads. Um, one of the things they did is organize among themselves to share intelligence about what roads were good and what roads were bad. So if you can imagine, you know, we have the AAA triptychs, you know, like you want to go from point A to point B. Well, they had their own version of that. Um, there was a book called the Vermont Road Book that had curated rides and so on. But this is a really interesting um, example or illustration of that. This is called 10,000 Miles on a Bicycle. And it was written, it's a 900 page book. It was written by a guy named Carl Krohn. Uh, that was his pen name. His real name was Lyman, ba Lyman Hotchkiss Bag. Um, but anyway, he rode around the Northeast, into Canada, into the upper Midwest, and he rode here in Vermont. And what he would do is he would talk to the local wheelmen and ride with them, and he would write down what are the roads like, what are the routes, and then he would get subscribers. And so every wheelman he met, he'd say, give me $5 and I will send you the book when I'm done, so that you know where is a good place to ride. And then at the back of the book, he lists all of his subscribers, which is, becomes this who who of wheelmen, uh, and then the wheelmen advocate group started using those names to build their case for better roads. So um, anyway, this is about this is a short description of a ride that he took here in Vermont. He has multiple descriptions, but this one's especially fun. So you can win at Vermont Trivial Pursuit if anyone ever asks you when was the first century ride in Vermont. We have the answer right here. It's in 1883, uh, two Rutland boys, W. Eggleston and N.S. Marshall, rode 100-and-a-half miles on July 9th, 1883. So just imagine, 1883, you're on a high-wheel bicycle. You ride 100-and-a-half miles. Can you even begin to imagine what that experience might have been like? How long it would have taken you? What mountains you would have to get up and over? how often you'd have to carry your bicycle. Um, so in 1880 in um, uh, Providence, Rhode Island, uh, that guy Albert Colonel Pope of Columbia and a bunch of other wheelmen, including Vermonters, show up and they're having a meet so that they can ride together and they can talk about, you know, the roads. And they create, at that moment, the League of American Wheelmen which still exists today. It's called the League of American Bicyclists. It's the, number, the prominent bike advocacy group in our country. So they create that, and at the same moment, they create the League of Good Roads. And these two sister organizations work hand in glove to promote bicycles and to promote good roads. And who bankrolls this? The Columbia Bicycle Company. It was Colonel Albert Pope. And he um, would travel the country giving addresses about the importance of good roads. Um, here's one from 1889. An eminent writer says, the road is that physical sign or symbol by which you will best understand any age or people. If they have no roads, they are savages, for the road is the creation of man and the type of civilized society. And then over here on the right, he, he, he did this quite often. This was an essay contest uh, directed at high school and college students. And if they wrote an essay about why good roads would make our lives better in this country, they could win a bicycle from Columbia. Um, so a real important uh, movement is building. And in Vermont, uh, it's uh, really quite influential. Uh, riders go on protest rides. Um, they try and draw attention to this. This is 
a ride just on the other side of Lake Champlain uh, to Osable Chasm. And I, I love this, this frog. Like, he's got a good roads message on his chest there. And so the whole idea of a protest ride was being invented by these individuals who were trying to draw attention to their cause. They also start aligning themselves with agricultural interests and um, uh, persuading you know, farmers' organizations to join this cause. Um, farmers were harder sell. Farmers thought these were just elitists on bicycles. And they, they could move their supplies largely by train. And so farmers took a while to come around here in Vermont. Uh, but farmers' organizations were pretty much on board quickly. And, um, uh, the wheelmen helped write legislation. They would fr offer friendly legislation to uh, the legislature, uh, language, things like that. And um, wheelmen organized um, uh, a, an organization called the Vermont League of Good Roads. Uh, so it was started by wheelmen, and they brought in military leaders and other prominent uh, officials. And they proposed legislation to totally change how we do roads. And they were one of the very, we, Vermont was one of the very first states in the country to change how we do roads. It centralizes control, it turn, basically gives the state power over the roads. Um, new property taxes are being collected to, and redistributed as state aid. And we get a state highway commission. And in 1892, when this is signed, Levi Fuller was governor. He signed it. And he was from Brattleboro. And his brother-in-law was a prominent figure in the Vermont Wheel Club. So wheelmen were actively pressuring politicians to change how we do roads. By 1900, we see uh, the bicycle is beginning to lose its luster because there's a new vehicle in the mix, the automobile. So this is in 1902. There's a the typical Fourth of July parade in Burlington has military, automobile, bicycle, horribles, trade parades, right? So we're at, so the, suddenly there's a new mix. You all know what horribles are, by the way? No. Horribles are a great New England tradition. They're like clowns who would dress up as prominent political figures at parades and mock them. Uh, we need that, you know? <laughs> we need more of that here in Vermont now. Um, but yeah, it was, they were like clowns um, and uh, in any case, you see vehicles now, you know, automobiles now getting uh, the fetish excitement quality that bicycles once had. You know, car drives up Mount Washington in 1899. The Vermont Motor Company is established in 1902. Horatio Nelson Jackson from Burlington is the first to drive a car across the United States on a bet. Did you, do you know that story? That's an interesting one. So Horatio Nelson Jackson was a physician. He was the um, son-in-law of William Wells, that hero of Gettysburg. And he was searching for a new purpose in life than being a physician. And he was out in San Francisco drinking with his friends. And he made a bet one evening in 1903 that he could, drive, he could go out the next day and buy a, an automobile and drive it to New York. And they were like, oh, that's funny, Horatio. You can never pull that off. And he's like, just watch. And so they bet 50 bucks. And uh, he did it. He bought a car, and he had a dog. <laughs> and they drove across the US. And it was quite an ordeal, as you can imagine, because there weren't good roads. Um, the, then the, what were once wheelmen's clubs become automobile clubs. right? The same individuals who were early wheelmen are the first to get automobiles, and they create clubs. And beginning around 1910, the bicycle is just sort of a background, solitary object in street scene photographs. It's no longer where the real excitement is for people. They're using them. They're just not using them that much. Um, and the story of the bike becomes this. The newspapers are full of the bikes versus cars, uh, you know, collisions. And one of these articles starts with like the typical Saturday night crash occurred on Williston Road between a bicyclist and an automobile. Um, so that narrative of bikes versus cars gets established here very, very early. And then bicycles become much more of kids' toys, right? It's about a tool for kids to have fun and be liberated. And that's that. Yeah. I heard recently that about this 
the ratio guy from Burlington, and I heard that Ken Burns did a piece on him. Now, I haven't confirmed that yet. I want to look it up. Is that, do you know about that? I don't know about the Ken Burns piece, but in the Smithsonian, they have a permanent exhibit with the car and pictures of Horatio and all that. I, I'm, I'm very surprised because you would think that we all would have heard about anything Ken Burns did, and, 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 <laughs> and that seems very uh, narrow for yeah. him. But anyway, I'm going to look it up. And I will for tell what it's worth, you can I all appreciate see it. That. Is. Yeah. Well, I think Bob Pollock, uh, several of them, uh, not only uh, public television did it. Did they do it? Yeah. Show on it. I'll dig it up. I'll dig it up. Somebody. Well, I'm always looking for old photos. If you have any, uh, Corinne has already hooked me up with all kinds of new stuff. But uh, I appreciate your your time and mm -hmm. happy to answer any questions or you know. Field comments or I actually have a question, but yeah. it's for Corinne because I know you're you you've really dug a lot of this up. But when you when um, there was discussion around um, Berlin and where the manufacturing was being done in Berlin, and then it became part of Montpelier, mm -hmm. where specifically was that? Do you do you know where was what? Where was the manufacturing when it was being part of Berlin? When you're standing at the Montpelier Shaws, yep, and looking across the river, that's where Montpelier manufacturing was. There's like yeah, these photos here. Is is that where the the cellar hole and the 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 old garage door that's been concreted no, in? No, no, it's across the street. So there's some real good maps of it up here. You can see there's the farms and then there's the yeah, 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 yeah. Did that road exist when the first bicycle came down or when the first car went up? Uh, it wouldn't have been a road. It would have, I mean, there were, I want to say there was a hotel up there. Right. Um, it was the first mountain bike, actually. It would have been a carriage. <laughs> yeah, really. Literally. It would have been a carriage road. It would have been a carriage road. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, so it's not just carried the bicycle up and rode it down. It would be, it would I would think so. Yeah, yeah, I would think so. Um, I mean, you, you know, you have to wonder about the braking system, right? Um, and oftentimes the braking system on those, those old bikes was literally just a spoon that would depress down on the wheel. So the whole idea like we have today of two pressure points coming, that wasn't the typical. It was just a spoon that would push down on the wheel. So the wheel would get really, really hot. Yeah. <laughs> and it was rubber and it could melt. <laughs> Shoes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. At, at this time, the safety bicycles, yeah. are they still direct drive? At, or when does a coaster come in? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think it took, I think there was experimentation enough in that era that you could find coaster mm. uh, bicycles, but they weren't that common, probably not until children are getting into bicycling and they're making children's bicycles. Um, but, you know, there are, interestingly enough, there are some high wheels that do have a chain and direct drive. So that they wanted to make them bigger and bigger. And as you get them bigger, like you're, it's just the limit is now leg length. So what they would do is they would have a gear here and a, and a chain and a gear up here with the pedals so that you could just get going really, really fast, right? And they were creating even gearing systems for those bikes. So there was a lot of experimentation, so I'm, I wouldn't be surprised. Glenn Ames would know this super quickly, but I wouldn't be surprised if back then that you could find models that were more coasters and coaster brakes, but also um, you know, free wheels, yeah. things like that. I, I ride unicycles, and oh, all there unicycles you go. are direct drive. Yeah, right. The tall ones with the chains, yep. because, and that's the way you brake, is to try to basically pedal backwards. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Speaking of Mr. Um, Ames, um, you said that he had a historical bicycle collection. Does his, it, does, how do you see his collection? Does he display it or? He, so he uh, used to own the old spokes home in Burlington and he, held, he had a lot of the collection there. Mm -hmm. He sold it, it went to his garage in the old North End. And then at the Sheldon Museum in Middlebury, he had an exhibit which was amazing. Mm -hmm. He brought out all of his greatest hits. Mm -hmm. And since this was like three years ago and since then he's been looking for a home. Mm -hmm. 
And there are a bunch of us who are kind of advocating that he keep that collection together and he's approached like the Smithsonian and he's approached all kinds of places. We would love to keep it in Vermont, um, I think. I can't imagine why the Shelburne wouldn't. Well, and they were going to have a show yeah. at the Shelburne Museum. Um, and Shelburne. that fell apart because of the pandemic. Mm. So, and then they have new leadership there. I had another question. Uh, have you ever ridden, you yourself ridden a high wheeler? I have, yeah. What's that like? Um, it does take, yeah, it, it's harrowing at first. Um, <laughs> you know, it's hard, you have to figure out how to get up, right? And there's always a little step and then you kind of throw yourself up and hope that, that at that transition point you don't just like go like this. So you have to roll, right? You get it rolling and then step up and, and go. So, um, yeah, I mean, it takes practice. I'll, I'll put it that way. Yeah. Big learning curve. Big learning curve. Yeah. What yeah. were the problems when the pneumatic tire first came out? What was that like? Yeah, that's a good question. What, what, you know, what were the issues with pneumatic tires? Well, first of all, they popped a lot. And so, you know, when we think of like, this is another way in which the bicycle laid down a lot of the groundwork for the automobile, is that there were repair shops that you could go to uh, kind of all over the place. It might be just someone's garage or something, but they would fix pneumatic tires. And uh, so cyclists could rely pretty well on having access to fixing pneumatic tires if they went on rides, because they popped pretty, pretty regularly. Yeah. They didn't have tubes, they were tubeless. Um, the tube came later, um, so they, you, know, you had to have glues and things like that. Um, but patching, they figured out patching very quickly. Um, but yeah, you know, it would, the, it, it, the safety design was, historians will say, was not quite enough to get a lot of people interested in bikes. It had to be that extra step of the pneumatic to make it less bouncy and jumpy and more comfortable. That was a, cre a key el moment for bike history. Otherwise, it could have just been another kind of flash in the pan and not gone very far. But the pneumatic tire is thought to be one of the key pieces that just explodes it for a lot of people. Yeah. But the velodrome never took off here. I mean, the woods here. No, it didn't. You know, there were there are reports of a velodrome in Essex Junction. Uh, I've never really found out exactly where. Where people would ride is horse racing tracks. And um, here, especially here in Vermont, there was a trotting uh, track in Barrie. Um, and that's where people would race here. Um, and, uh, but yeah, velodromes never really took off here in Vermont. They did elsewhere. And one of the, one of the big spectacles of the era was the so-called six-day race, where cyclists would ride in a velodrome for six days. And um, you know, they, were, they were eventually, because they were so horrific, um, you know, people dropping dead, literally. <laughs> you know, they were so horrific that they eventually started changing it so that you could have an hour rest in a day kind of a thing. Um, but in, endurance um, events were huge in that era. And the six-day race was typically a small-scale affair uh, in terms of the audience for the first four days. And then around day five, people started showing up because they knew that's when the real fireworks started because people bodies would be flying all over the place. And so I have not found any six-day races in Vermont. <laughs> I'd like to look at your Swanton slide again. Could sure. you bring that up? Yeah. Oh, the right names. Uh, there are some yeah, there are names yeah. there. Were you, uh, do you have Swanton ties? I, yeah, it yeah. could be that time too, but there's no names there. Uh, but, but I know. Well, if any of you have any bicycle mysteries and, and, and relatives that you wonder if they had bicycles or if they were involved, just send me an email because I can dig it up. I'm pretty facile with ancestry.com and with newspaper.com and all that. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here. I appreciate it.